Episode 22 was with William Ryan Key of Yellow Card, kind of. Well, he was in Yellow Card. <laughs> but he had some new jams. Yeah, we saw him in his solo tour, which his solo stuff doesn't sound anything like Yellow Card, but it's amazing. Yes, still very awesome. And we saw him at uh, the Roxy Theater, interviewed him at the Roxy Theater in Hollywood. Yes, and thank you so much to Heather Hawk for connecting us with him. We're bringing it backwards with William Ryan Key. That was the best take ever. <laughs> oh, shit. I do it all the time. All right, we are here with William Ryan Key, uh, but you go by Ryan Key. Yes, or you... my parents have called me Ryan my whole... I've always gone by my middle name. Oh, always gone by your middle name. Yes, but, but William, is, records. William is my legal name, so I'm not just trying to like sound cool by <laughs> having a longer name. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> I wanted to just differentiate this from Yellow Card as much as I could. I, I think that uh, stylistically, sonically, it, it's just not anything like yellow card it doesn't Mm -hmm. the songs i'm writing don't aren't in the same even like universe i don't as 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 just the rock music that yellow card is making so anything i could do to just kind of draw a line in the sand that was saying like that was that was then and this is now so very cool just using my full name and it's my grandfather's name on my mom's side and he was like a big part of my life so oh wow yeah uh so you grew up in uh in jacksonville florida i did yeah tell me a little bit about growing up there did your um, grandparents live there? Like they moved down there from so so my family. I have a big family that's um like like big extended family that's all for the most part from central and northern Georgia. Uh huh. Um, my dad is an only child, and his job so so I don't have like uncles, aunts, and uncles on his side. Sure. And uh, so his job brought us to brought my parents to Jacksonville. Okay. And that's why we grew up there. But like my whole other than my mom and dad, the rest of my whole family was in Georgia. So. A lot of them ended up moving down to Jacksonville too, mm-hmm. um, and um, my grandparents included. But Jacksonville is a very interesting place. It's um, it's a water like a uh, it's a water town. There's there's a huge river, and then there's the ocean. There's the o- ocean, the ocean and beach cities. Um, it's it's very it's very laid back, like, but it can also have so so it can have like this really cool beach town cultured like hip forward thinking side to it, mm-hmm. but it can also have this like really unfortunate middle America red state. Sure. Sure. You know, just like, I mean, I don't want to get into politics, but for lack of a better way to put it, just <laughs> the things I don't agree with. Right, right, right. People I don't align with. <laughs> it can have that as well because here's the thing about Florida is you think Florida, you think Disney world, you think Miami, mm-hmm. you think beaches and, and you know, like, latin culture and cuban sandwiches and that uh, you know the islands you think of right so when you say you're from the south and people ask well what part of the south you're from i grew up in florida people tend to be like well that you're not from the south then you're from florida yeah people don't really associate and you have to explain to them that i didn't say miami i said florida because most of the rest of florida except for those pockets is deep south like okay and i lived i mean jackson was 40 minutes from the border of georgia so it's a very deep rooted southern town sure. um, wow. and so yeah my, my, my parents both have like dr- thick drawling southern accents and <laughs> stuff so um it's a really interesting place man it's it's like like i said it's it's stuck in the in the past in some of the worst ways but it's also super hip and cool and forward thinking in some of the best ways um so it's really just like i guess it's like anywhere to you surround yourself with when you're there you know but uh, I left when I was 19 and, and haven't ever really gone back. So, oh, really? Uh, yeah, right did, after high school, I moved out here to California. Did you, were you already playing music? Yeah. Or, I, so, how did you kind of get into music? I like had a band on the weekends in high school, um, but that was certainly not what I thought I would, because was going to do with my life. Like, I had, I had no ambition to be a musician. I really? Like, yeah, zero. I mean, literally zero. I never would have. <laughs> I, I was not applying myself to become a better musician or a better mm-hmm. vocalist or like learn more about song. I just, I had a band with my friends on the weekends because there was a lot of local bands in Jacksonville and it was fun and Nirvana Nevermind came out when I was 11 years old. So right. I got a guitar, <laughs> you know? So, um, I, but I, I went to school for, I went to university at, at Florida state for a minute and, um, I was going for theater and I was going in the, in their bachelor of fine arts program. So it was like an audition only. So were you trying to, uh, um, were you trying to pursue acting? Yeah. That's okay. what I did my whole life, like from diapers until college. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so were you doing like local theater stuff when you were younger? Or? Uh, yeah. As a little kid, I did that. I took dance lessons. I did all of it, man. Just put me on stage. My mom just didn't know what to do with me. And she that's- was rad though. She wasn't like a stage mom. She was just like, cool, go do whatever 
whatever you want to do. That's know? really right. She wasn't like dragging me around town and like, you know, <laughs> making you, makeup you. to yeah. auditions, you know? So, but I went to a performing arts high school and that changed a lot for me. So like, I didn't, I was like doing a lot of, I was, I was doing actual like plays and stuff whenever I could, or we would like go to Orlando sometimes sure. to audition for a movie or a Disney thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did do a lot of dance lessons and stuff as a kid. Like that was a big part of my like little kid childhood because sure. there wasn't a lot of theater to do. Mm -hmm. And I think my mom sort of thought that was like an application where I could get that creative stage like outlet out, you know. Um, but when I started going to a to my high school, which was like a magnet program for the arts, mm -hmm. change every I quit everything else. I was deep hard into the theater thing. Like I into was acting all and about and theater. Yeah, like like applying myself hardcore to get into university. I wanted to go to Boston University. That was like my dream to go mm -hmm. to their BFA program. I got into school, but I didn't get into the theater program. So like I got accepted to Boston, but not to the BFA program. Uh, okay. But I was in the BFA program at Florida State and it was like in state. So it was free and I had a scholarship to go to Florida State. And my parents were like, we're not sending you to Boston where it costs $10 billion <laughs> yeah. dollars a year when, when you're not free. even in the right program. <laughs> so I, and I never really gave it a chance. I went to Florida State and I, I kind of hated it. And, oh, and yeah? I just never really opened myself up to it and so that's where the band thing came in I, I i i had still been playing with friends back home i had like a little band at college that i was doing you know like practicing in a storage locker somewhere you know sure on the weekends and um long story short just like we were we had a great scene in jacksonville of, of that 90s kind of warp tour the birth of warp tour mm -hmm. um the kind of skate punk and west coast yeah and and northeast punk bands and 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 what became pop punk you know we didn't even know that was a thing until people started calling us yeah it. i mean we, that was kind of it wasn't a genre in the 90s you know sure e even even when blink came out it wasn't it, we weren't calling it but we weren't it, calling it pop. yeah punk, i mean know? i grew up so, in san diego with yeah. with where Blink, you know, came yeah. out of and, and a lot of those bands that were in that Warped Tour circuit and it wasn't. Yeah, pop there, punk that wasn't yet. a label. Just, so it was just punk. We had all those bands, you know, those bands would come through No Effects and Lagwagon and No Use for a Name and Bad Religion and all those bands would come through. We loved them all. So that was what all our bands sounded like. <laughs> so there was this band in California that um, in Santa Cruz, California on Tooth and Nail Records called Craig's Brother. OK. Um, and they put out two records on Tooth and Nail. And the first one we had, you know, like our little scene of, of friends had gotten a hold of the album and we just loved it. And and I uh, I ended up joining the band. I sent them like a tape, a cassette tape of my high school band. I dropped out really? of college. I took all my scholarship money and I drove my car to what to the West Coast with so all my shit just, in the back. <laughs> you just had an ambition. You're like, I'm going to I'm going to send well, this I look stuff back to them. on it now. And I That's think it's crazy. I know. I know. And I look back on it now and it was definitely more of just kind of like, a, I love you mom and dad, but like a, like a fuck you to my parents really was the move. Like yeah. for not letting me go up to Boston. I mean, I like, never let go of it you. really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never really let go of it. And I, yeah. So I went out to, I came out here for the first time to California when I was 19. Oh um, my gosh. And then, and it only lasted about eight or nine months. And I, I just, you know, I ran out of money and uh, we couldn't pay my health insurance and whatever else. And I was, smart enough to not be i, I wasn't quite not punk rock enough to not pay insurance you yeah know, so, live on the streets and so yeah <laughs> so i went back home and i re i went back to florida state again and i still hated it and um yeah the rest is kind of history i started jamming with the yellow card dudes when their singer was gonna quit and yeah because you you sang backups on the the first record yellow card record you were you I, were I wasn't, just like no, you weren't officially I wasn't in even, the band i didn't even right? play i didn't do anything Oh, you didn't even sing on that record? No, they put or, out two records in high school that I had nothing to do with. Wow. Yeah. And then how did that transition be? Like, how did you, you know, join their band? You just they, were friends of the guys? They were, we, we went to high school together. Oh, oh so you went yeah. to high school with the... Okay. Yeah. So their, their vo the vocalist for the band was not going to do it anymore. And the guitar player was going to move up and do vocals. Um, and then and we had always been buds. And they knew I like to write songs. And so... Um, you know, I don't remember exactly how it went down, but it was basically like a come come jam with us at spring break kind of thing. And it did. And that led to like, we're recording this little EP. You should come hang and play on it. And that led to they weren't stoked on the dude, the, the, the guitar player singing on the record, I guess. Uh -huh. And they were like, you sing. And I was like, that's not my I'm not doing that because I don't want to get in the drama of all of this. Like, I don't like not my scene, you know? Yeah. And they were like, oh, it's fine. We'll be fine. And so unfortunately of course for like a decade plus the dude that was gonna sing and i like it took us 10 plus years to reconcile because you know, oh I, sure I was put in this like pretty shit position <laughs> and was assured that it was all going to be fine yeah uh, but i ended up singing on this little ep 
It, it's not like out. You can't even hear it. I don't, I, don't, I don't even have a copy of it. Oh, wow. And that's what we got our first little record deal from. Was this little four song EP we recorded over and, spring break in 2000. And were you guys touring on it or nope. doing anything? Just playing no, around had some Florida area? Like original dudes. Had, yeah, like weekend shows in Florida. Right. So, yeah. And then they had, they had some friends at, at the label that we assigned to. Like a couple okay. of guys in the band knew a guy that worked there. And they had like always been sending them music to try to get signed. And then they finally did. And they signed you guys and you... And you moved back to California. Is that what you said? Yeah, I somehow talked all of them into quitting their jobs. And was that where the label was based? Santa Barbara. Yeah. Okay. And then from there, you guys get signed to Capitol Records. Yeah, it was it was a year and not a year and a half. We signed a deal. We we moved out. Everyone got out there uh, like January of two thousand one. Uh huh. We and yeah, I think that's when like the final move was made for the other four guys in the band. I I had gone out earlier, but everyone came out and we signed our deal memo with Capital in April of 2002. Wow, so it was like 15 months or something. How? Tell me, walk me through that. Like, so you you guys are spawning to a smaller label, and then were you doing shows around the area? Like, how yeah. did you grab the attention of Capital? We were playing like crazy, dude. We were playing. Uh-huh. F- like we would play two shows in a night. We'd play a show in Riverside and then drive to Anaheim and play another one. Wow. And we were just like playing like crazy. Just really um, grinding it. And we did our first little tour pretty quickly though too. We, we we started playing, I think we played our first California show back in the fall of 2000 while we were recording the album out here Uh huh. at Chain Reaction. We got like a 15 minute spot at the beginning of a show one night. Wow. And then we finished the album, everyone went home, I stayed, everyone came back. We started booking more stuff like that. Like trying to open for anyone we could and do all this stuff. And and so somehow uh, we turned the head of what ended up being our booking agent for our entire career. We never changed wow. booking agent. We had the same booking agent from 2001 to 2017. And um, she came to a chain show or something like that, chain mm-hmm. reaction show or something. And um, she had already, she used to work for Stormy who booked Warp Tour and Blink and a lot of those bands back in sure. the day. I think she booked Blink. But anyways, I know she booked all the Warp Tour bands yeah. for the most part. So she worked for her like fresh out of high school. She's our age, our booking agent. She's like a year older than me, maybe. <laughs> and um, she came out to a show and was like, hey, I, I've started booking my, my own bands and I have my own little company and I want to put you guys on some shows. And we were like, you don't you don't sign like a contract with a booking agent. Yeah, you just. It's very handshake. Hopefully so she can we get like, you on some cool, gigs. Let's do it. And then in that that fall, we got to we did a we were like first of three, I think, on uh, Rise Against Mad Caddy's tour because she Corey Christopher, wow. our booking agent, was booking Rise Against. Uh, that was like her first band she signed and we were her second. So, so you guys, so your first so major tour was with, one we did like was, the first tour Rise we Against. did where we knew there were going to be people out there to like let us into the venue because it was actually booked, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. was with Rise Against in the fall of 01. Um, so that was a lot of, there were a lot of SoCal shows then. And then, yeah, that, that winter spring, we just kept hitting it hard. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I guess, you know, that with Blink and, and happening at that time, you know, and some of the other bands that were coming up, there was that feeling in the music industry of, you know, something new is happening. So we got to grab sure. all the bands we can uh-huh. sign a hundred and one will stick. Yeah. If that's the mentality. It always has been always. Right. Been. Of course. And so we ended up getting it like, I mean, it was mind blowing. We were way out of our league. Like we ended up in a full blown like bidding war with Warner brothers records and Capital gonna, and yeah, American recordings. And that's amazing. And, yeah. It was nuts, man. And, uh, and we ended up deciding that we felt like Capital was like, Right was place. the right choice mm-hmm. so all these labels start coming towards you like hey we want you and then it just became a bidding war right. after that first rise against tour yeah wow and then i mean they obviously made a great decision and yeah. you guys had a platinum record yeah like tell me can you talk to about that like you said you didn't even want to pursue music really and then now yeah, you have a, like a platinum album it was a very double-edged sword dude it was obviously like mind-blowing and and is the reason I get to still play music today. And like, I never could have imagined like a dream like that, getting that big and coming true and all that. But at the same time, it was also, there was a lot of, per, just personally, I can't speak for everyone, man, but sure. like for me personally, there was a lot of negative shit that came along with that too, because, oh, is that right? because of what you just brought up. Like, I was not prepared. I was not ready to be responsible for fronting this giant thing and i was Mm -hmm. super insecure about my voice and my voice wasn't that good i'm being honest like if you listen to live recordings of me from 2004 it kind of sounds like shit and that's but it's fine with me because i'm aware that i had no idea what i was doing it was just all just overnight it was like hey you're playing on the video music awards now sure you know and it wasn't until two years later i had um i developed a cyst on my vocal cords and i went down for surgery and we canceled a bunch of tours and 
everything shut down. That's the first time in my life I ever took a vocal lesson. Like that's when I oh first was like, oh, I should learn how to sing, you know, cause I don't want this to happen again. So like, I, I kind of actually like really shut down and I went to a pretty, pretty dark place actually through the whole Ocean Avenue experience. Oh my gosh. I was, yeah, it was, it was a weird time, man. From childhood, I've always been a pretty high strung, like high stress sure. individual. Uh -huh. Very grateful that um, marijuana is legal in, uh, in California. <laughs> yeah, right. I wish I would have like known. I, I probably would have done it more as a younger person. I yeah. didn't. I didn't. I, I, I've, it's been a thing in my life for the last like two years, maybe. Sure. But it has like changed my entire demeanor for the better. I mean, and I, it's like, uh, and I only bring that up because I was uh, like just a high stress individual. Yeah. And so pile on all of the pressure that came with that record and the success it the had, success of it the was album not the right environment for for my personality type without any coaching or any like learning it was just overnight you know mm -hmm. and uh yeah so tell me about okay you get to play the music awards you get to you know do you do you remember those experiences i don't remember all of them specifically uh -huh. i remember the first time we saw a video on mtv we were all on the bus we knew what time it was going to premiere cool we were just sitting there watching and it's pretty insane from that record on i mean you guys continue you had continuous success yeah we did no i mean nothing hit like ocean avenue hit um but but yeah, we continued to tour at like this ridiculously high level. <laughs> sure. And um, for many years, and it's it was it's crazy. It's, I mean, I look back on it, just, just mind blowing. Yeah. And then you guys kind of had like, you kind of disbanded in what like oh seven oh eight, and then you guys decided to get back together. You put out a couple more records on Hopeless. Yeah. And um, when did you start writing and going like, okay, I want to start pursuing my own like solo stuff well like a year after the band really i had no yeah i had no plans to do any of this to do any kind of like solo releases or touring or anything and you just we're just going to be done with it trying to produce bands and just get into the songwriting game and stuff wow yeah this is not this my work as a like solo artist and these eps i put out like have nothing to do with the yellow card splitting up at all there was no like, hey guys, I think I'm done. I'm gonna go make my own. Yeah, yeah. Songs. It just happened. It happened and, a year, a year after. And then yeah. you're like, well, I can write songs. Let's. Yeah, it let's... was like ripping the bandaid off, kind of for me. I sure. Think. Like, just do it. Just write some songs, and then I realized, like, oh yeah, this is what I love to do. That's awesome. I'm really uh, interested in the process of. So you're in this band you know this high school your buddies from high school like when did you know that you could write music like when like when you when did it like click like oh i can write songs because you said like you join the band as the singer and they're like oh well he can sing and he can write music like yeah. how did you prove to them like hey like look i can write songs like do you remember like when I mean, you lo learning like, guitar and i then like never took guitar lessons or anything at all i i always my my initial draw to music as a 12 year old when i got my first guitar was to write my own music oh wow so uh, yeah i didn't i had other people show me how to do stuff you know people be like this is a bar chord and i was like oh my god <laughs> i can play smells like teen spirit now okay you know i had no idea what i was doing i just made noises <laughs> with guitar and songs. so yeah i guess always i guess i always felt like that's what i that was you know more than a, i would say songwriter first musician second which okay would be how i've developed and, my career so and even lyrically is did you always write yeah lyrics yeah even as a young kid yeah i, I was as a as a little little kid I, I i wrote a lot of stuff my mom has like boxes of like stories and stuff i would write wow. so i was always like into you know if you're a math kid or an english kid you're mm -hmm. kind of one or the other you know right and i was definitely like an english and history kid not a math and science kid so i always loved to write and i guess you know just it was it was definitely also like the rock and roll of it is what really appealed to me mm -hmm. in the beginning too. Like I wanted to be in a band on the weekends with my friends and go play shows and meet chicks and do the band. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was like that was a, a big part of it for me. It was like going out and being rock and roll. But what you know, were as you keep going and learning about your ability, it's you realize like oh okay, well there's there's stuff in there you know that mm -hmm. wants to come out. Yeah. Just keep writing. Do you remember the bands that were influencing you at the time? Or like, well, so like I started who you playing, saw and I, we were like, whoa, that, I want to be in a rock I'm like band. a pop kid. I grew up, I, I, my parents didn't have a lot of musical influence on me. Like they're, okay. they weren't really, there wasn't like music in the house all the time. Sure. You know, and they weren't really like invested in artists that they like love. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Not to say they don't love music, but I would say they're more like kind of casual music listeners. Yeah. Um. So I didn't have records that like, you know, that I could like, I'm not a 
this is gonna people are gonna be really upset but like i'm not a fan of the beatles <laughs> i don't like the beatles get it respect it don't enjoy listening to it sure. my parents played beatles records for me my whole life like half of my friends I yeah really you love probably the love the beatles but as an adult finding a beatles record it doesn't do anything for me you know that so so i grew up on people ask the question like i think beatles or stones is a question right like, sure which one yeah. are you and i always answer zeppelin but um <laughs> Which isn't a bad answer. But, yeah, right? so, but, uh, but even that, like I didn't get into Led Zeppelin records till I was like 20. Because wow. Was, you know, I just, so I grew up on, on the radio and MTV and whatever was being fed to me through, okay. through pop music. Um, so luckily in the 80s and 90s, pop music was rock music. It's not sure. anymore, but it was then. Yeah, it and wasn't so, quite um, pop, pop. Yeah. So I went through all the phases of like being a little kid and being into like Michael Jackson and New Kids on the Block and Boys mm-hmm. to Men and all that like R&B and pop you know, stuff that was happening in the mid eighties. And then that all shifted even in the mainstream to like Guns N' Roses and Def Leppard and mm-hmm. the late eighties, early nineties kind of hair metal and, and metal rock. So, you know, but, yeah. but what really, and it may be cliche, but I'm, I don't care. The real like life changing thing for me was Nirvana. Okay, is that, mean, that, okay. that was the first record that like moved me, you know, that was like, sounded dangerous to me sounded like yeah i knew my parents were gonna hate it and like not <laughs> let me listen to it and like you know the lyrics were like super challenging for a 12 year old kid to figure out yeah. what, what he was what he meant by any of that but still being drawn to like the the guttural just like visceral you know punk rock in it yeah and and then that so i got really into the alternative grunge stuff. i mean i was like wearing out nirvana and pearl jam and soundgarden and stone temple pilots and mm-hmm. all that I just wear wore those records out um and uh and then a good friend of mine gave me my first like a like warp tour kind of style what would now i think be called pop punk but um i think they would hate being called that but uh <laughs> i got a no use for a name record that was my first that they're there which one they're Leche and Carne? Yeah. oh i love that record yeah, it's so that such was, an I amazing had a buddy album. That, i had a buddy that was already playing in a band that was kind of doing that double time like no effects yeah that drum beat and uh-huh. they were but they he was younger than me so i'm 16 at the time so he was probably 14 or 15 okay I had a kid i grew up with one of my one of my closest friends and um i went we worked together at my um our dads were in business together owned a car dealership and so we went to work one summer when he was finally old enough to come and work i had already done it for a couple of years but he came and we're working you know we're like sneaking off to smoke cigarettes together <laughs> and like just just being degenerates you know yeah. high school kids and one day he was like oh, you know we do we both do the band thing like you should totally come over while wow. and, and see my band play and uh so i went over to, to his house and, and he was the drummer i went over to his house and saw him play and i had never heard anything like that i had oh. never heard that drum beat i had okay. never heard the guitars playing those like octave harmonies and yeah and, you know that melodic punk never heard it and i was just it floored me and seeing it live i think for the first time hearing it live was a lot different than hearing it on a record for the first time or whatever yeah so that was your first experience yes. too was your yes, friend's I had band i never heard anything and wow. so when i was leaving that day he was like take this record and and try it out see if you like it <laughs> and that was it and you know then i was a fat records kid after that that's so amazing i had a band that was like super grungy sure uh super alternative grungy and i was immediately like we're not doing that anymore <laughs> we're gonna do this instead you know that's when i fell into like uh, you know, the scene of bands like my friend's band that I went to see and Yellow Card was starting to play. They had sure. started up um, in high school. So I played, my, you know, my little band played with them sometimes mm-hmm. on the weekends. And, um, yeah, so that's like how I discovered that style of music. And and it didn't last, I will tell you that. Like, I don't <laughs> listen to it anymore. And it's been a long, long time since I've yeah. been into like punk punk rock music. Yeah, I think you just kind of grow uh, with it. Some people do, yeah. some people don't, you know. But but uh, for that time, it was right. And it led me to Yellow Card and it led Yellow Card to write the songs we wrote. So what, you know. That's amazing for a reason and all that stuff. I would have never guessed. I mean, personally, I, that's one of my favorite records. I think Soulmate is one of the best songs ever. Written. I love that record. <laughs> I still do love the records. It's just like, yeah, it's just, you don't, I just don't put it on yeah, I don't listen to because it. there's, yeah. yeah. And it certainly doesn't really influence my, my songwriting. Right. What are, what are you listening to now? That's influencing the, the oh, solo man. stuff. I listen to <laughs> very little music that has any words in it. Oh, I really? The pretty much only instrumental music that's cool whether it's like post-rock bands mm-hmm. um or or even I'm, I'm into a lot of edm a lot a lot of oh really a lot of ambient like yeah like more cinematic kind of soundscapey style edm not not like vegas party EDM. right 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 more um, but of i like... listen to a lot of it like like hours a day <laughs> so um yeah i think over the last decade or so i can i think coldplay is kind of my favorite band of all time wow. sort of has become i just that's the 
a lyric, a band with lyrics that yeah I still regularly listen to like daily. Um, but yeah, I listen to a lot of soundtracks. I listen to a lot of just like scores, yeah, to yeah. like film scores and yeah. stuff. And, That's cool. And I, I feel like I'm applying a lot of that to what I'm writing now too. Like the songs are coming in movements and waves kind of, as opposed to like being just verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Right, yeah. right, right. So. Right on. Well, um, do you have any advice for in- inspiring artists? Yeah. Um, I think that like my advice over the years, as much as the music business has changed, my advice hasn't changed very much because Mm -hmm. like it's going to keep changing. So like as far as like advice, people ask you about like streaming and all this stuff. It's like, I can't tell you about that because it's not going to be there anymore. It's going to be something (laughs) totally different. Yeah, because all that wasn't even around when Yellow Card. But I mean, and and the only the other piece of advice that I can't give you is like is how to write good songs. (laughs) You know, so I, and I say that without ego, like not that I write good songs and you don't, but yeah, that said, I write songs and people like to listen to them and that's a big part of the puzzle. Sure. So I'm very lucky that whatever gift I have to do that, you know, that I have it and I can't give you that as advice, but I can tell you that live music is still the final frontier for making a living as a musician because, you know, the pipe dreams of being like the mega super halftime Super Bowl stars is just like, you got to. If it happens, it happens, dude, and that'll be awesome for mm-hmm. you. And I'm not saying don't dream big, but but like your your dream should just be I just want to play music for a living. And right. And if you go out and you apply yourself to that and you put yourself into it wholly and fully and you write good songs and like you might end up playing the halftime of the Super Bowl. But if like if that's like your own, you know, and visualize that, visualize all the big shit you want to do. That's totally cool. Yeah. But don't like have the entire end game be stardom, you know? get out and work and tour and that's i mean that that's how i can only speak from experience and that's how yellow card built our career that's how i'm building my own career now i'm exhausted dude i'm (laughs) I'm about to turn 40 years old i'm riding around in a van again you know like humping gear in and out of venues every day and night after being on a tour bus with a crew of 10 people for 15 years like but it's the only way to do it i mean my other option is to quit you know so my advice is always just play live music dude just get out and play every show there's going to be really shitty ones where you're like playing in a backyard for four people. <laughs> but if someone offers you the show, take it. Take like, it. 